Okay, and that brings us to Jen, uh, Jen Giacomo asked in an email titled, only if you are short on questions for Dave, otherwise happy to resubmit come September. And here we are. Hi, Dave. It's Jen again. Hi, Jen. Since you have had to endure so many interviews over the years and read through even more as you've meticulously researched a litany of literary figures, I am curious who you find to be the best interviewer based on personal experience and in a broader cultural sense. Um, in terms of personal experience, I think probably um, it'd be a toss up between, uh, between Kim Thompson, who was um, at the time that I did the first part, uh, Denny and I did the first two-part interview for uh, for the Comics Journal. Um, he was he was very very well informed about Cerebus at the time. That was uh, 1982. He interviewed us in uh, in New York during the first American tour. Um, Yeah, I would I would have to say personal experience on that one because uh, an interview and an interview subject are always a matter of um, the time that it takes place and um, where they where the interviewer is in um, his interviewing career and where you are. Or creative um, years of being interviewed, and that was uh, a happy mix of the two in uh, in 1982, which is why it ended up being a two-part interview. It was he was well versed enough in in his subject that um, each subject led to another subject, led to another subject, led to another subject, so that. Hey, I'm getting hungry. Let's go out and get some Chinese food. And uh, talking, uh, talking while while having dinner, and coming up with whole other areas that he wanted to get into, and me suggesting, well, okay, if you get into that, then it's going to lead over to this. And it's like, oh, that will be good because that will hook up with this over here, where it becomes not so much an interview as collaborative communication exercise uh, in a broader cultural sense. Uh, that led me over into, um, uh, okay, what, uh, in, in a broader cultural sense, what um, hits, hits, the, hits that hot button for me and uh, I went and uh, dug out uh, Norman Mailer, the presidential papers, and Norman Mailer's advertis advertisements for myself, um, where I wasn't, wasn't really sure what I was looking for, but uh, uh, I knew they were in there somewhere, something that I went, uh, yeah, this is... Uh, Q&A format, uh, so pretty, pretty interesting stuff. If 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 I if I had uh, available reading time, this is probably something I'd like to go back and reread. Uh, one of them was uh, the advertisement for uh, 69 questions and answers. So this is really Norman Mailer's introduction to. Uh, this magazine piece that was called 69 Questions and Answers. Um, not very much need be claimed for this interview. Those who like the dialogue, questions and answers between a newspaper and uh, an author may find it interesting. Uh, Lyle Stewart, an old friend and the editor of The Independent, uh, then called Expo Day, uh, sent me a list of 69 questions after I had agreed to do an interview with him. I glanced at the questions once during the day and then later that night answered them more or less consecutively, a friend taking down my words. The only merit of the interview is that it was published 
because of the way that it starts off. What is the literary situation in America now? I think my attitude will come out as I answer the question. That's, that's mailer being a typical subject. Why? Because that is the way I answer questions. If you were giving advice to a young writer on the brink of fame, what would you say? Uh, try to keep the rebel artist in you alive, no matter how attractive or exhausting the temptation. Uh, that's that's really, really good. As somebody who was at least partly reading Norman Mailer to find out, okay, how do I do this? That, that seemed to me very, very practical advice, which uh, I, I continue to, uh, to follow. Uh, the next one was advertisement for buddies. So he introduces this. Uh, what comes next is the fragment of a one-act play. It runs along for about 10 minutes and then breaks off in the middle. I started to write it one afternoon and went along at good speed for two hours. Hardly a word has since been changed. That night I started to smoke after seven days without cigarettes. Went to the ordeal which is legally called the Ideal Bar, and is situated across the street from the White Horse Tavern. Quietly went through eight or nine shots of blended whiskey, went home at closing, fell into a leaden, bombed out sleep, and woke up at half past 12 in the afternoon with the mood of my play shattered beyond repair. I have not been able to find a new thought for it since. That action was as careless as anything I've done in a while, but in any case, the play would probably have run down sooner or later. For to keep its life, the situation would have to become more outrageous with every minute of stage action. Probably it could have been successful only by a major effort. Let us leave what was not done with the dependable remark that good beginnings to plays are easy to write. And it's, it's a really good piece. It's uh, basically um, Norman making two sides of a discussion, one as a Russian and uh, the, other, the other as an American, sort of epitomizing the, the Russian uh, bear and uh, uh, Uncle Sam and what, what they would have to say to each other. But a uh, good textbook example of that's exactly something that you don't want to do is quit smoking for seven days. And then when you get a gift like this from wherever your literary gifts come from, which none of us knows, and uh, you instantly go back to smoking and then compound it by going out and uh, drinking instead of sticking with your play, you kind of deserve to have lost something that might, might very well have uh, have turned out to be uh, a real, real going concern. Um, I think uh, good, good beginnings to plays are easy to write. Mm, that's true, but that's that's sour grapes. I think I think Norman knew that. Uh, he had lost something there, and it was his fault that he lost it, and would try not to do that uh, in future. Uh, the other one is uh, Norman Mailer presidential papers, um, and this is a uh, an impolite interview. Uh, in this dialogue, uh, the subjects grind by like boxcars on a two-mile freight. Uh, never do so many intellectual items seem to be handled so quickly. It would be fatal if the cargo were fragile or the mind of the reader. Done with elegance, such an interview might be appropriate to a president. Uh, as done by Paul Craster and myself, it reads, if one may shift the metaphor, like a blow-by-blow blow of two strong club fighters going 16 rounds in a gym. Here is the schedule of our rounds. Pacifism, the FBI, the sexual revolution, birth control, literary style, totalitarianism, the new revolutionary, the aesthetics of bombing, masturbation, heterosexual sex, adolescent sex, sexual selection, homosexual sex, the sex of the upper class, and Negro sex. 
last round is devoted to mysticism. Uh, it, it's it's really good. It doesn't really qualify as an interview, I don't think, because uh, Paul Krasner had his own credential. It was one of those, I can't think of two more unlikely people to have um, a, a badminton discussion, which is usually what interviews are. I'll, you know, sort of lob something nicely over the net, you lob it back as, as carefully as well. Um, but it, it was another one of those, uh, particularly for the time period, if you want to know, if you want to see uh, freedom of expression struggling to uh, free itself from uh, the, uh, the immediate post-Eisenhower uh, time period, um, an impolite interview is a good example. First off, when you and I first talked about the possibility of doing an impolite interview, we kind of put it off because you said, I find that when I discuss ideas, it spills the tension I need to write, which seems like a very Freudian explanation. Uh, does it still apply? And Norman replies, it does. Sure it does. I think putting out half half worked ideas in an interview is like premature ejaculation. Uh, then why bother? And Norman says, I got tired of saying no to you. <laughs> That's all. I'm beginning to get a little pessimistic about the number of ideas I never write up. Perhaps the public is better off with premature ejaculation than no intellectual sex at all. I'm just thinking of the public, not myself. And that's just how it starts. And then it goes on for, oh, how many pages here? God, it's got to be 20 pages. So, yeah, for um, a kid growing up in, uh, in the 1970s, it was, uh, and, and wanting to be a writer, it was, oh, freedom of expression, like push the boundaries, um, say the things that, uh, that you're, you're not supposed to be allowed to say. Uh, but those, uh, no, those aren't really uh, high-end Norman Mailer um, aspects where Jen's asking about uh, in a um, broader cultural sense, um, best interviewer. Uh, the more I thought about it, the more I came to the conclusion that uh, the best interviewer, uh, without parallel, I would have to say was um, Alex Haley, uh, who uh, you know had his own creative career and wrote uh, well, wrote Roots um, based on the fact that uh, he wrote the autobiography of Malcolm X and uh, I got I got my copy here uh, the back cover of the autobiography of Malcolm X this will give you an idea of the reason that I say that, that Haley is particularly important is because uh, he brought out the natural eloquence that uh, Malcolm X had, but he also knew how to, he knew that his job was to find the best parts of it and distill it so that uh, it communicated um, Malcolm X to his best advantage. So it's all, it's all quotes from Malcolm X on, on the back cover in one block of text. I believe that it would be almost impossible to find anywhere in America a black man who has lived further down in the mud of human society than I have, or a black man who has been any more ignorant than I have been, or a black man who has suffered more anguish during his life than I have. But it is only after the deepest darkness that the greatest light can come. It is only after extreme grief that the greatest joy can come. It is only after slavery and prison that the sweetest appreciation of freedom can come. For the freedom of my 22 million black brothers and sisters here in America, I do believe that I have fought the best that I knew how and the best that I could with the shortcomings that I have had. I know that my shortcomings are many. When I am dead, I say it because from the things I know, I do not expect to live long enough to read this book in its finished form. I want you to just watch and see if I'm not right in what I say, that the white man, in his press is going to identify me with hate. He will make you 
use of me dead as he has made use of me alive as a convenient symbol of, quote, hatred, unquote. And that will help him to escape from facing the truth that all I have been doing is holding up a mirror to reflect, to show the history of unspeakable crimes that his race has committed against my race. Yes, I have cherished my, quote, demagogue, unquote, role. I know that societies often have killed the people who have helped to change those societies. And if I can die having brought any light, having exposed any meaningful truth that will help to destroy the racist cancer that is malignant in the body of America, then all of the credit is due to Allah. Only the mistakes have been mine. And significant um, paragraph here. This is um, the, uh, um, Alex Haley's afterward. Uh, after signing the contract for this book, Malcolm X looked at me hard. A writer is what I want, not an interpreter. I tried to be a dispassionate chronicler, but he was the most electric personality I have ever met. But I still can't. But I still can't quite conceive of him dead. It still feels feels to me as if he has just gone into some next chapter to be written by his story. And uh, there you go. That's another example of the uh, of the transit point. But uh, in terms of uh, in the 1960s. 1965, just the idea of these these two men, um, Malcolm X, knowing that his days were numbered, um, he had made you know the profound mistake of uh, believing that Elijah Muhammad's Nation of Islam really had anything to do with uh, with the Muslim faith, and you know having made the uh, the Hodge to Mecca and uh, found out what Islam was about and then returned to America and you know there's there's the um, the nation of Islam Malcolm X and then there's the um, Muslim Malcolm X uh, he knew that he wasn't going to live very long he knew that, uh, that they were gunning for him and the fact that uh, uh, just the sheer courage to remain uh, as sharp as he did and to become sharper and sharper and for Alex Haley to become sharper and sharper, knowing uh, this is it, uh, he's, he's going to get shot. Uh, we just don't know when it's going to happen. How much, how much of this can we get done? And that that was... That was, you know, it was only part of what he was doing. It's like you've got to still got to bring in revenue, uh, even though uh, you're being hunted. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the the book was a way to do it. You get a book contract. Okay, I'm going to get this much money. Um, Alex Haley will get this much money. Um, but you know, I, I I have other things to do. I have to go out and make speeches. I have to make my impact felt. I can't just sit down and write a book. So you have to write me. And it's uh, just a, just a dazzling accomplishment. So that's uh, if 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 you're talking on a scale of one to ten. Uh, yeah, I would uh, I would definitely put uh, Alex Haley. Okay. Now we all know the worst the worst interview you've ever had had to have been the five questions from the Yahoo group. Oh no, no, no. That was always uh it's it, it, it's the sa- it's really the same thing as, as with Paul for Dave Sam. It's uh um, it's it's one of the it's one of the easier parts of my job is <laughs> being asked questions where I go, oh, I know the answer to that. And and not only uh, did I know the answer,
answer to it. But, uh, you know, we are all uh, part of uh, God's clockwork mechanism. And, you know, it's, it's functioning pretty smoothly here. And it's always interesting that I go, okay, here's, here's people living, um, you know, scattered all over the United States and, and Canada and, uh, uh, you know, some, sometimes Europe. And uh, all of them coming up with their questions separately. But uh, there's, as soon as I'm reading them, I'm going, okay, I know how to answer all of these. And actually, they, they interweave in, in the most amazing way. Well, I mean, the, uh, you know, when I, when I had that, uh, um, the paragraph that I just read from uh, Alex Haley saying, uh, it still feels to me as if he has just gone into some next chapter to be written by historians. Uh, at the same time that I'm going, okay, um, try, trying to explain, explain the death as a transit point. It's like, you really, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't intentionally sit down to hook those, hook those up any better. Well, I, I'm just thinking about Lenny's multi-part lawyer questions where it's, you know, your answer would be, okay, so question one, seven, or, or question one, C, question one, D, and going back and rereading them, I'm like, that's why you could tell when Matt started getting involved with the questions, because that was where it would be a long three-paragraph preamble to get to yes or no, this. He posts on the Facebook page, but he has his settings set so that if you're not his friend, you can't see it. And I'm not his friend on Facebook, so I don't get to see it. It is hilarious every time it happens. <laughs> is there a reason you're not Lenny's friend? Ah, uh, because I use a pseudonym and I haven't sent him a friend request. And it's one of those, it's just, I forget about Lenny and all of a sudden somebody's commenting, like, wait, what are they commenting on? I'm like, oh, it's it's content that I can't see. Okay. Like, like it, it's like Lenny's in his own private service group. <laughs> I don't. I, I actually. I used to. The past. The past few months. I. I would go on break at work, and I would have my phone, and I would have something else, like a, a book or something, and it'd be okay. I'll just check my email quick, and then I'll read the book for the ten minutes I have for my break, or the half hour I have for my lunch. And invariably, I would spend the entire time playing on my phone. And it got to the point where the past week and a half, I've went. My phone stays in my pocket of my coat at work. I'm just going to pick up the book and read the book. And I've been reading Catch-22 because I love Catch-22. And I'm like, I'm going to reread this. And it's and the chapters are short enough that I can get through a chapter in 10 minutes or I can get through a couple chapters during my lunch. And I've discovered that I really love that book again. And I'm not missing the fact that, hey, you got an email that doesn't matter at all. That You're going to delete it the second you see it. You don't need to delete it now. You can wait till 2.30 when you get out of work. Is that the, uh, the fear of missing out thing? Part of it. Like, like Mondays, I know I'm getting a fax from you, and it's going to be the Monday report. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll, I'll read this now, and then when I get home, I'm going to, you know, post it up onto the blog. It's like, why do I have to read it at 9.30 in the morning? I'm going to reread it at 3 in the afternoon when I'm putting it together into the blog. I can wait. It's not... Right. The end. Of, right. it's, it's not like the fax is going to disappear and I'm never going to see it again. Right. And and it, yeah, I mean, it, it's human nature, I guess. Well, well, actually, it's not even human nature. It's the animal nature that you know, Twitter and Facebook and all these social media groups pay psychologists to figure out. Well, how do we get them to hit refresh as many times as possible so they can see <laughs> newer ads that we can get paid for? It it it, it very much is is the chimpanzee that they trained to smoke. Like, it seemed like a good idea when they did it, and now they have a chimpanzee that's smoking three and a half packs a day. 
Bibles and I keep going. I should take the Bible to work and read it on my breaks. And that, and what stops me is I'm gonna have to bring a notebook to write down the note of okay, I read this. This is what I think about. And it's like it. It's not gonna be one of these. Oh, you can read three or four pages during your ten minute break. It's gonna be you're gonna read one passage of one you know one verse and then you might run out of time before you're done writing. And I'm going, eh, we'll stick with, with something light and fluffy. Light and fluffy at work, and, and if I'm going to read the Bible, it's going to be okay. Now it's time to read the Bible. Right. Right. What, what, what do other people do on their 10-minute break? Are you all, are you all sitting, are, are they all sitting there with their cell phones? Yeah. They go in the break room and, and they tell... Uh, we have a PA system that they play the radio, but the radio is turned off in the break room because people want to talk or stare at their phones or whatever. And every time I go in the break room, I'm like, because the, the volume knob's right there, and it's like the volume's at zero. Nobody's in the room. Nobody's coming in the room. I'm like, eh, screw it. And I turn it up to six so you can hear the music, and I walk out. And the next person to come in, it's, oh, this is too loud, and they turn it back down to zero. And it's it's a fun little game I play with everybody at work of, you know, I know the people that don't want to hear anything, and I know that other people are like, hey, we're listening to good music, you walk into the room, and all of a sudden it's quiet. Why not just have the right. music playing? Right, right. I'll tell you, it's a whole new world. <sighs> there are some days where I'm at work and I'm going, you know, Dave's sitting at the off-white house all by himself doing whatever he wants and I am so envious. <laughs> yeah, in in dead silence and uh, just, try, just trying to play all of the caroms of I never know how the day is going to go. Um, well, I knew how the day was going to go. Um, uh, please hold day is okay, read the questions and um, if there's something that you have to look up, you 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 better look it up. And uh, this this was just one of those times. Even though it was uh, much shorter questions, it's like, okay, um, where are those Norman Mailer interviews, and which ones am I thinking of? And uh, yeah, I would have to say Alex Haley. Um, how do I do a Reader's Digest on uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X? And let's let's do the Monday report. And let's let's do the Monday report um, trick on uh, you. You have one page to explain what you have to say about the Taliban, and it. If, it, if it's, it spills over by like two or three lines, you're going to have to cut the two or three lines. And I have very, very good instincts now as to when, no, I think I'm past the bottom of the page. Time, time to start cutting. Speaking of time to start cutting, to start cutting uh, it's time for me to go and get ready for a prayer time. So. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure talking to you as always. I, I always enjoy it. I gotta tell you, Matt. I always, I always enjoy it because uh, I, I don't, I don't find out a lot about what's going on out in the world, uh, except through through newspaper filters, which is which is a completely different kind of kind of communication thing. But uh, in terms of that that real world where there are people who only get ten minute breaks to do what they want. Count your lucky stars that um, you're doing what you want. You're you're kind of swamped by it, but uh, but it's all.